fairy tales can be pivotal to our childhood, as a lot of us can name a Disney movie off the top of our head. Personally, I really liked watching princess movies because I liked the idea of being a part of royalty. I know I dreamed about finding out that I was in line for the throne because of how fun it seemed to be. Today we are discussing the Princess Diaries movies, breaking down the movie's themes that helped to understand growing up. It's rare we see a movie follow a character, specifically in her teen years, and place a focus on how vulnerable this time period is in girlhood. Even in the special features section from the first Princess Diaries movie, Mia Thermopolis is classified as a new princess. Obviously we're not quite sure how you turn someone into a princess, but we, we take a few licenses and we try to imagine what would be done. Julie helped out a lot. <laughs> Julie is totally in charge of this picture. Is the flower this way? What kind of fork is it? Is this the right jewelry box? I have something I want to give you. Here. Oh, um, thank you. I'm sort of the female Henry Higgins, if you wish. Oh, I can give you books. You will study languages, history, art. Mia Science. doesn't know how to be a princess on her own, and so she has to be taught. The posture and manners matter and all of those things. Her posture is just horrendous. So she's taught how to sit, stand, walk, eat, all these very important things. And action. And now for the salad. Grandma, is it customary in Genovia to imprison your dinner guests with, um, with Hermes scarves? She's being tied up in a scarf against the chair so that she will sit straight. It's Hermes. The scarf is merely a training tool. Eventually, you will learn to sit and eat properly without it. So naturally, her posture was improving, and she was learning more about herself and what made her feel good. But no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Eleanor Roosevelt said that. Yes. Another special lady like yourself. Princesses usually seem to revolve their identity around femininity by fitting its gender roles and her relationship to a man. Throughout both movies, Mia seems to reject and oppose following the typical princess story. This showed a shift in Dizzy's portrayal of princesses because after seeing the success of Mulan, when she's not as dependent on a man and focusing on independence, it might have paved the way for Mia Thermopolis years later. This began to be more apparent with princesses like Tiana, Elsa, and Merida, who were determined to accomplish their goals and exhibit having confidence in themselves. Hello, Mia. Hey, Doc. So, what's the diagnosis for my baby? Hmm? $400. Yeah, I know. It costs to be cool, huh? This is not my day. The first Princess Diary movies came out in 2001 and revolves around Mia Thermopolis, a high school student who finds out she's in line for the throne in Genovia. This movie follows her having to decide to take the throne and abandon her life in San Francisco. The first movie has been described as a coming-of-age story because Mia is having to experience a lot of change in her life and accept a lot of responsibility at a young age. There's a lot of good aspects in the first movie, specifically how vulnerable one is at 15. Joe! Yes, Miss Mia? I don't want to run my own country. I just want to pass 10th grade. So can't I just tell everyone that I simply quit? No one can quit being who they really are, not even a princess. Now, you can refuse the job, but you are a princess by birth. Oh, how can I tell if I can even do the job? By no. simply, simply trying. Like the fancy dinner coming up. She thinks you're ready. Really? At 15 years old, Mia has never been in love. And first love is a common theme in coming-of-age stories. We see Mia fantasize of what she wants, specifically relating to her crush on Josh, imagining herself kissing him. When she finally gets Josh's attention, he isn't who she thinks and uses her to further himself, which breaks her heart. There is this line discussing what she wants to happen when she kisses someone. I just kind of hope that if he kisses me, um, my foot pops. Pops? Yeah. You know, in old films, whenever a girl gets seriously kissed, her foot would just kind of pop. Her first kiss was photographed and was made into a story that allowed her to be made fun of. Her first kiss is not a moment that she wanted to be ridiculed, especially because she dreamed of making that moment special. In addition, Lana tricks her and she ends up changing thinking she's safe, but the paparazzi gets photos of her in a towel. After she realizes her first is not always the one, she notices how Michael has been there for her all along. Loss is rather minor in this movie as she never really knew her father, 
but one of the best scenes in the entire movie was when she reads the letter from him. Throughout the movie, she seems to be conflicted about her feelings for her dad. Mia is about to run away because she does not think she could be a good princess, but hearing his words of comfort made her feel like someone understood her. It is a custom in my family to pass on a piece of wisdom when one reaches this age. I pass it on to you as my father passed it on to me. Amelia, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something else is more important than fear. The brave may not live forever, but the cautious do not live at all. Mia's best friend is Lily, and their friendship is comforting for Mia, as we see that she's rather invisible at school. She's nervous to speak in front of crowds and gets teased by Lana. The shift in her popularity happens when the world finds out she's heir to the throne, and she begins having people say hi to her and being noticed. It made sense why she was excited to go to her first party because she was the girl that was always on the outside looking in, and being able to experience it herself was big for her. Her identity is changing as she's learning how to become a princess with the help of her grandmother. She has relied on her invisibility at times and now she's being recognized. Our teen years are influential to our identity and she has to learn to balance who she was to who she's becoming. We see her various behaviors and reactions, ranging from anger, to surprise, to happiness, and to sadness. She's experiencing a lot in a short amount of time. When she finally becomes princess, she's embracing another part of herself while still being the same teenage girl that's awkward and trips over herself. However, we see throughout the movie how much confidence she gains by talking back to Lana or having her star moment in gym class. She relied on running away from her problems, but eventually decides to face them and embrace being a princess. <gasps> yes! Oh yes! I, 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 I absolutely accept! <laughs> Prince William. He's not eligible because he's in line for his own crown. Oh. If he's not eligible, why is he included in these pictures? I just love to look at him. Oh, me too. To contrast, the sequel focuses on Mia turning 21 and has 30 days to find a husband so she can ascend the throne. The sequel is described differently from its predecessor being classified as a romantic comedy, which does change the tone of the movie. While the first one was reliant on establishing a story and following Mia along on her journey to become a princess, this movie is telling the story about love. This movie is even titled The Royal Engagement, so the audience knows that this movie will revolve around Mia falling in love. This movie seems to transition from girlhood to womanhood, which is demonstrated by her closing the first movie in a dress that was white. We know white is associated with light, innocence, and purity while her first dress when she enters for her 21st birthday is red. Red is associated with power, leadership, and love. This first dress is already providing an introduction to how the movie will go. The transition from 16 to 21 are so different, especially having to figure out life after graduating college. Mia became a princess at 16, but now is having to become queen and lead a country. Mia has to figure out what type of leader she wants to be and the direction that she wants to take. This movie certainly is not for everyone as the plot is weaker, meaning the movie can feel directionless. However, this movie does a great job of displaying qualities of Mia from the first one and being a character-driven movie. Mia still shows that she's clumsy and we see that countless times. Near the end of the first movie, she talks about how she wants to turn her thoughts into actions, which we see happen during the parade by opening a children's home. She talks about how she wants to kiss a guy and have her leg go up and it happens with Nicholas. She has lessons teaching her how to be queen that parallels the scenes from the first movie. She also has a transformation scene with the same designer, paralleling the reveal that we associate with the predecessor. Mia's relationship with her grandmother is stronger in this movie because before she lived with her mom, but after going to college, her grandmother is helping her become queen. We see how close Clarice has gotten to Mia with comforting her when she's indecisive about marriage and how Clarice has changed since meeting Mia. She seems to really let loose and I can't put the song in, but the song that Julie Andrews sings in this movie is adorable. Mia's lack of privacy continues in this movie, depicting how photos can be misinterpreted. Her art demonstrates how harmful constant media coverage can be, eventually becoming invasive. This parallels how the press covers the royal family in England and how the paparazzi covers celebrities. Being constantly analyzed and watched can be difficult, and in the first movie we see her struggle through it. However, in the sequel, we see how confident she has become 
and now she's comfortable with it. The audience is able to see how much more confidence Mia has in this movie by adjusting to being talked about on TV and having a public wedding. After her first relationship with Michael, seeing her move on was weird, but your first relationship does not mean it will last forever. In this movie, she has two relationships, Nicholas and Andrew. She meets Nicholas who contrasts Michael as he gets under her skin while Michael was the friend she had known for years that eventually grew to care for her. Nicholas looks like the typical prince we see in movies even down to his introduction. Mia steps on his toe and they have the typical love at first sight look. They even slow dance at her 21st birthday. When she figures out he's trying to take the throne, she sees him as the enemy. Andrew is who she's set up with and is having to get to know him in the public eye, while also figuring out her feelings for him. A small detail I noticed was how much she wore pink while being with Andrew. While in multiple scenes with Nicholas, she was wearing blue. While Andrew might have been the right decision to accomplish being queen, Nicholas went against what she knew. In addition, blue was a color that was worn a lot more in the first movie with her school uniform being blue. So it was interesting that the color Nicholas wore a lot was a color that she was familiar with from her life before she was a princess. Freedom is more prevalent in this movie compared to the first. Mia made the choice to be a princess, which was a big moment for her. However, in this movie, she rejects the idea of marrying someone solely to become queen. At the end of both movies, Mia is surrounded by her friends and family and doing things her way. To contrast with Clarice, she has feelings for Joe, her bodyguard, and finally lets herself do what's best for her without caring what others will think and marries him. Love does not solely have to be romantic, but can be from your friends and family. Her identity is intact in this movie, but we do see how she's still learning to become her own person, especially with the legacy she wants to have. Carolina, would you like to be a princess today? I can't, I'm too little, too big a lot. Oh no, because I declare that anyone can be a princess today. Well, why don't we get you a tiara and you can wave and march in the parade. In fact, why don't you all take tiaras? Or give them all free tiaras. I'll take care of it later. Thank you. You get on the bed, the silver one? I'm on the bed, I'm on In the first movie, she's under the guidance of her mother and even Clarice to help protect her. Sadly, when the paparazzi gets pictures of her spending the night with Nicholas, it represented how people might take advantage of her because of her influence. Even paralleling the beach party from the first movie. She cannot always be looked after and the fallout made her distrust Nicholas for not understanding how she values private moments. At 21, you're still learning about yourself and not the adult you think you are. Nobody really knows that they're princess until somebody touches their lives and says it. Well, as I said, I have faith in you. And that doesn't mean that they have to come from royalty. It means how you feel inside. Overall, the Princess Diary movies are a classic because they are able to fulfill a fantasy of becoming royalty while being a story of a girl navigating life. Mia Thermopolis is more than just the Queen of Genovia, but she was a teenage girl that did not ask for what happened and was able to accept it. The Princess Diaries was able to display the concerns that girls have, even showing that in our 20s we are still trying to navigate love, friendship, and identity. The two movies have slightly different tones and still maintain Mia becoming who she is and gaining the confidence needed, specifically because being a princess is more than just what's on the outside, but what's on the inside.